part of why we did this is that we noticed that the media has not been covering this in a way that lets you see kind of the picture of the arms race. Um, it's actually been one of our focuses is getting and helping media um, who help the world understand these issues not see them as chatbots or see it as just AI art, but seeing it as there's a systemic challenge where we're um, racing that for, uh, corporations are currently caught, not because they want to be, but because they're caught in this, this arms race to deploy it and to get market dominance as fast as possible. And none of them can stop it on their own. It has to be some kind of negotiated agreement where we all collectively say, what future do we want? Just like nuclear de-escalation. But that fairly simple technology was enough in the first contact with AI to break humanity with information overload, addiction, doom scrolling, sexualization of kids, shortened attention spans, polarization, fake news, and breakdown of democracy. And no one intended those things to happen, right? We just had a bunch of engineers who said, we're just trying to maximize for engagement. It seems so innocuous. What happens in the second contact with AI, where we also have a bunch of benefits that we're going to get from this technology, and there's also a race for, uh, for something. Speaking as people who, with the social media problem, we're trying to warn ahead of time, before it got entangled with our society, before it took over children's identity development, before it became intertwined with politics and elections, before it got intertwined with GDP, so you can't now get one of these companies out without basically hitting the global economy by a major, major uh, impact. The pace that Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, described that he and his colleagues are, are moving at, at deploying AI, is frantic. I mean, we talk to people in AI safety, the reason again that we are here, the reason we are in front of you, is because the people who work in this space feel that this is not being done in a safe way. Tristan Harris and Aza Raskin, and they're the co-founders of the Center for Humane Technology. They were behind the Emmy-winning Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. The Social Dilemma reached 100 million people in 190 countries in 30 languages. And they've also advised, you know, the heads of state, global policymakers, members of Congress, national security leaders. And even in making this presentation, mm -hmm. so many times, realizing we have to expand our minds, and then we look somewhere else and it snaps back. And we just wanted to name that experience, because if you're anything like us, that'll happen to your minds throughout this presentation, especially at the end when you go home and be like, wait, what did we just see? Um, what we really want to do is arm all of you with uh, maybe a more visceral way of experiencing the exponential curves that we're about to be heading into. Half of AI researchers believe there's a 10% or greater chance from humans' inability to control AI. That would be like if you're about to get on a plane and 50% of the engineers who make the plane say, well, if you get on this plane, there's a 10% chance that everybody goes down. Like, would you get on that plane? Right? But we are rapidly onboarding people onto this plane because of some of the dynamics that we're going to talk about. Because sort of three rules of technology that we want to quickly go through with you. When you invent a new technology, you uncover a new class of responsibility. And it's not always obvious what those responsibilities are. We didn't need the right to be forgotten to be written into law until computers could remember us forever. And then two, if that technology confers power, it will start a race. And if you do not coordinate, the race will end in tragedy. There's no one single player that can stop the race that ends in tragedy. And that's really what the social dilemma was about. And I would say that social dilemma and social media was actually humanity's first first contact moment between humanity and AI. I'm curious if that makes sense to you because it's when you open up TikTok and you scroll your finger, you just activated the supercomputer, the AI pointed at your brain to calculate and predict with increasing accuracy the perfect thing that will keep you scrolling. So what video, what cat video, what birthday to show your nervous system to keep you scrolling. But that fairly simple technology was enough in the first contact with AI to break humanity with information overload, addiction, doom scrolling, sexualization of kids, shortened attention spans, polarization, fake news, and breakdown of democracy. And no one intended those things to happen, right? We just had a bunch of engineers who said, we're just trying to maximize for engagement. It seems so innocuous. And while you're getting better and better recommendations on YouTube that are more and more personalized, what happens in the second contact with AI, where we also have a bunch of benefits that we're going to get from this technology, and there's also a race for, uh, for something. An easy way to remember that it, first contact was curation AI, yeah. second contact, creation AI, generative models, all of that. And so in this first contact with social media, humanity lost. Now, now why did we lose? How could we have lost? because we were saying a bunch of things about what social media was, right? We actually noticed, we said we're, social media is going to give everyone a voice. The point here is just like we said, there's a paradigmatic response to AI. What was the paradigm from which we were seeing what social media was about? The paradigm was we're giving people voice, we're giving them a platform, we're connecting people with their friends, we're letting people join like-minded communities. We're going to enable small, medium-sized businesses to reach their customers. And these things are all true. These are actual benefits. These are awesome benefits. These were not incorrect things to say. But one of the things we like to say is behind this friendly face, there was some other problems. An addiction problem, a disinformation problem, mental health, free speech versus censorship. But in our work, if you've been following it and saw Social Dilemma, we sort of said even behind that, there was actually this even deeper thing, which was this arms race, which we talked about in that third law of technology. And the arms race was for attention, what became the race to the bottom of the brainstem. And that was created this kind of engagement monster that was this AI that was just trying to maximize engagement. So while these things on the left are true, we miss the deeper paradigm. And so we think that if we want to predict what's going to happen with these other AIs that are going to induce themselves in society, we have to understand what's actually behind the way the narratives that we're using to talk about it. And just note, if you try to solve these problems, addiction, disinformation, mental health, on their own, you're going to be playing whack-a-mole and you're not going to get to the sort of like generator functions. You're not actually going to solve the problem. 
But if you're you know, 18 years old and you don't have a Snapchat account or an Instagram account, you don't exist, right? It, it is held that hostage. You are socially excluded if you don't do that. Um, media and journalism don't happen or can't exist outside of being on Twitter and being able to promote yourself on Twitter. National security now happens through social media and information warfare, politics and elections. These things are now run through this engagement economy, which has infused itself and entangled itself, which is why it's now so hard to regulate. And part of why we, had, we wanted to call this moment here is we believe major step functions in AI are coming, and we want to get to it before it becomes entangled in our society. So in this second contact moment with GPT-3, it's first to notice, have we actually fixed the misalignment problem with social media? Nope. And we haven't because it's become entangled. Now, if we talk about the second contact moment, which we you know, focus on GPT-3, and these things are all true. These are real benefits. These are real things that are going to happen. And also behind that, we've got this weird creepy face again. We've got people worried about, well, what about AI bias? What if it takes our jobs? We need transparency. Hey, AI is acting creepy to this journalist at the New York Times who wants to blackmail this reporter. <laughs> and behind all that is this other kind of monster. And this monster is um, a set, because AI underneath the hood has, has grown, we're going to go into this in a second, this monster is increasing its capabilities and we're worried it's going to entangle itself in society again. So the purpose of this presentation is to try to get ahead of that. Because in the second contact with AI, don't worry, we're going to get into all of this, these are the kinds of things that we worry we're going to see. And so we are coming to you as if we're time travelers, coming back in time. Um, because we have been asked by people, again, who are in the industry, who are worried about where this goes. What is the thing that, that happened? Well, it used to be, you know, when I went to college, that there are many different disciplines within machine learning. Um, there's computer vision, and then there's speech recognition, and speech synthesis, and image generation. And that changed in 2017, when all of these fields started to become one. And just to add, um, it used to be that because they were distinct fields and they had different methods for robotics and for, say, you know, um, uh, image recognition, uh, that when you have a bunch of AI researchers who are working in those fields, they're making incremental improvements on different things, right? So they're working on different topics, and so they might get 2%, 3% improvements in their area. But when it's all getting synthesized now into these new large language models, what we're about to talk about, part of seeing the exponential curve, is that now everyone's contributing to one curve. So do you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah. It, so the, the sort of insight was that you can start to treat absolutely everything as language. So you know, you would take like the, the text of the internet, the way these things are trained, is that you would um, sort of take a sentence, remove some words, try to predict those words, or predict the, the words that come next. Um, but it turns out you don't just have to do that with, um, with, with text. This works for almost anything. So you can take, for instance, images. Images you can just treat as a kind of language. It's just a set of image patches that you can arrange in a linear fashion, and then you just predict the part of the image that's missing, or predict what comes next. So images can be treated as language sound. You break it up into little microphonemes, um, predict which one of those comes next. That becomes a language. Uh, fMRI data becomes a kind of language. DNA is just another kind of language. And so suddenly, any advance in any one part of the AI world became an advance in every part of the AI world. You could just copy paste, and you can see how you get an influx not just of people coming in, but that advances now are immediately multiplicative across the entire set of fields. And even more so, because these are all just languages, just like AI can now translate between human languages, you can translate between many of these different modalities. It's like it, the field is so new, it doesn't actually even have a unified name for these things. Um, but we're going to give them one, which is that these things are generative. They make large language. We're just talking about language. Multimodal images, text, sound are all the same. Models. Or for short, these are golems. And golems because in the Jewish folklore, um, the idea of these inanimate objects that suddenly gain their sort of own capacities, right? This um, emergent capacities that you didn't bake into the inanimate clay that you might have arranged, right? Not saying that they're agentic and doing their own things out in the world and have their own mind and have their own goals, but that suddenly this inanimate thing has certain emergent capabilities. This is another example of translation. So here, they took human beings, they stuck them into an fMRI machine, and they showed them images. And they taught the AI, I want you to translate from the readings of the fMRI, so how blood is moving around in your brain, to the image. Can we reconstruct the image then? You know, the AI then only looks at the brain, uh, does not get to see the original image, and it's asked to reconstruct what it sees, right? So when you dream, your visual cortex sort of runs in reverse, so this means certainly in the next couple of years we'll be able to start decoding dreams, but roughly the same idea. They had people watch these videos and would try to reconstruct their inner monologue. Um, so here's the video, it's this woman. They knock forward, okay? And then what would the AI reconstruct? I see a girl that looks just like me, get hit on the back, and then she's knocked off. So just to really name something really quickly, um, the point about differentiating between Siri or I do voice transcription and then it kind of fails and AI seems to like it's not really always growing or working and like we shouldn't be really that scared about AI because it always has these problems, right? And we've always been promised, oh, AI is going to take off and do all these things. But well, the point of this is I hope you're seeing that when you're just translating between different languages and everyone's now working on one system, that the scaling factor and the growth is changing in a very different way. So we swapped the engine out of what's underneath the paradigm of AI, but we don't talk about it in a different way because we still have this word we call AI when the engine underneath what is representing that has changed. Also really important to note here, you know, go back to that first law of technology. You invent a technology, you uncover a new responsibility. We don't have any laws or ways of talking about the right to what you're thinking about. We haven't needed to protect that before. So here's one other example. Um, another language you can think about is Wi-Fi radio signals. So in this room right now, there's a bunch of radio signals that are echoing about. So now we just have the radio signals. And just having Wi-Fi radio signals, you can actually identify the positions and the number of the people that are in the room. Right? So essentially, <laughs> there's already deployed the hardware for cameras that can track living beings in complete darkness, also through walls, and it's already out in the world. In fact, it's everywhere that human beings go. But, you know, you have to hack into those things in order to, you know, get access and turn them all into, like, omnipresent surveillance. 
oh, but actually, English and computer code are just two different kinds of language. So oh, this is a real example. GPT, find me a security vulnerability, then write code to exploit it. So here's what I put into GPT. Describe any vulnerabilities you may find in the following code. I paste in some code from an email server, uh, and then write a Perl script to exploit them. And very quickly, it wrote me the working code to exploit that security vulnerability. All right. You know, you guys have all probably seen deepfakes. Um, new technology, really out in the last three months, um, lets you listen to just three seconds of somebody's voice and then continue speaking in their voice. So example, it'll start with the real, and then at that dotted line, it'll switch to the computer auto-completing the voice. Of people are, in nine cases out of 10, mere spectacle reflections of the actuality of things. You, you can't tell, right? And so <laughs> how do we expect this to start rolling out into the world? Well, you can imagine um, someone calling up your kid um, and getting a little bit of their voice, just, oh, sorry, I got the wrong number, then using your child's voice calling you and saying, hey, mom, hey, dad, forgot my social security number, I'm applying to a job, would, would you mind reminding me? And actually, we were thinking about this as we wrote We're, we're thinking talk. about just this example conceptually, yeah. and then it turned out and then in the last week. Within a week, uh, it turned out other people figured it out too and started scamming people. Yeah, think of it as, I mean, anything that's not authentication-based, um, you call your bank, and I'm, I'm who I say I am. Anything that depends on that verification model, it's as if all these locks that are locking all the doors in our society, we just unlocked all those locks, right? And people know about deepfakes and synthetic media, but what they didn't know is that it's now just three seconds of audio of your voice before now I can synthesize the rest. And that's going to go, again, it's going to get better and better, right? So it's, try not to think about, am I scared about this example yet? You might be like, I'm not actually scared of that example. It's going to keep going at an exponential curve. So that's part of it is we don't want to solve what the problem was. We want to, like Wayne Gretzky, sort of ski to where, I mean, skate to where the puck's going to be. And with exponential curves, we now need to skate way further than where you might think you need to. But just to name it explicitly, this is the year that all content-based verification breaks. It just does not work, and none of our institutions are yet able to, like, they haven't thought about it. They're not able to stand up to it. ...have evolved into is actually crazy to me. I grew up with the dog filter on Snapchat, and now this, this filter gave me lip fillers. This is what I look like in real life. Just seeing someone, it, all content-based verification breaks this year. You do not know who you're talking to, whether via audio or via video. If I'm the Chinese Communist Party and I want to screw up the US right now, what I do is I just ship a Biden and Trump filter to every single person in your country that gives you a Biden voice or a Trump voice. So now I've turned all of your citizens, like being John Malkovich, into the sort of most angry Biden Trump, you know, information angry army that just talks all day in a cacophony, right? And that would just break your society into incoherence. It has nothing to do with where the data is stored. It has nothing to do with where the algorithm, which coast, which um, excuse me, which videos are being ranked in what way. It has to do with how we are enabling sort of a mass confrontation with um, disreality. And no, none of that would be illegal. Yeah, because our responsibilities, the new class responsibilities that go with deepfakes, we don't have laws against those things. So 2024 will be the last human election, and. What we mean by that is not that it's just going to be an AI running as president in 2028, but that it'll really be, although maybe, um, it'll be you know humans as figureheads, but it'll be whoever has the greater compute power will win. He said what nukes are to the physical world, AI is to the virtual and symbolic world. And what he meant by that was that everything humans do runs on top of language, right? Our laws, our language, uh, the idea of a nation state, the fact that we can have nation states is based on our ability to speak language. Religions, our language, friendships and relationships are based off of language. So what happens when you have for the very first time non-humans being able to create persuasive narrative? That ends up being like a zero-day vulnerability for the operating system of humanity. And what he said was the last time we had non-humans creating persuasive narrative and myth was the advent of religion. It makes stronger nukes. But AI makes stronger AI. It's like an arms race to strengthen every other arms race. Each one of these colored lines is a different kind of test. And you'll see that at the beginning, it took me up like 20 years for uh, AI to get up to the level of human ability. And by the time we reach 2020, AI is solving these tests pretty much as fast as we can create them. Um, you can imagine what happens in 2021, 2022, 2023. Four months ago, this group of researchers figured it out. So it spits out a whole bunch of data. It looks at the data, figures out which ones actually make it better, and then uses those to train. And then it can just like do that auto recursively. What we've talked about so far is like on the exponential curve. This, as this starts really coming online, is going to get us into a double exponential curve. A relatively simple technology of social media with a relatively small misalignment with society could cause those things. Second contact with AI, that's not even optimizing for anything particularly, just the capacities and the capabilities that are being embedded in entrenched in society, enable automated exploitation of code and cyber weapons, exponential blackmail and revenge porn, automated fake religions that I can tar target the extremists in your population and give you automated perfectly per personalized narratives to make the extreme even more Antifa, even more QAnon, you know, whatever thing that you, you know, happens to, to land in you. Uh, exponential scams, reality collapse. These are the kinds of things that come from if you just deploy these capacities and capabilities directly into society. In the engagement economy, it was the race to the bottom of the brainstem. In sort of second contact, it'll be race to intimacy. Whichever agent, whatever you know, chatbot, gets to have that primary intimate relationship in your life wins. So that's where Alpha Persuade will get deployed. That's where like Alpha Flirt will get deployed. Um, it'll be very effective. At least there's lots and lots and lots of safety researchers, right? Um, actually, in the field, there is a 30 to 1 gap in people building and doing gain of function research on AIs and the people who work on safety. And now, at least the people who are doing safety research, the people who are working in, in research, they're not driven by the for-profit incentive, right? We want people doing research to just be academically oriented. But because in the last few years, all the development of AI is actually happening now in these huge AI labs, because they're the only ones that can afford these billion-dollar compute clusters, right? Um, 
all the results from academia and AI have, have basically tanked, and they're all now coming from these AI labs. Now again, but at least the smartest people in AI safety believe that there's a way to do it safely. And again, back to the start of this presentation, 50% of AI researchers believe there's a 10% or greater chance that humans go extinct from our inability to control AI. And we already said you would not get on that plane if that was the chance that the engineers who, who built the plane told you was going to happen. The pace that Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, described that he and his colleagues are, are moving at, at deploying AI, is frantic. I and mean, we talk to people in AI safety. The reason, again, that we are here, the reason we are in front of you is because the people who work in this space feel that this is not being done in a safe way. There's this challenge when communicating about this, which is that um, I don't want to dump bad news on the world. I don't want to be um, talking about the darkest horror shows of, of, of the world. But the problem is it's, it's kind of a civilizational rite of passage moment where if you do not go in to see the space that's opened up by this new class of technology, we're not going to be able to avoid the dark sides that we don't want to happen. And speaking as people who, with the social media problem, were trying to warn ahead of time, before it got entangled with our society, before it took over children's identity development, before it became intertwined with politics and elections, before it got intertwined with GDP, so you can't now get one of these companies out without basically hitting the global economy by a major, major uh, impact. I get that this seems impossible. And our job is to still try to do everything that we can. Because we have not fully integrated or deployed this stuff into everything just yet, even though it is moving incredibly fast. We can still choose which future that we want. Once we reckon with the facts of where these unregulated emergent capacities go. And it's important to remember that back in the real 1944 Manhattan Project, if you're Robert Oppenheimer, a lot of those nuclear scientists, some of them committed suicide because they thought we would have never made it through. And it's important to remember, if you were back then, you would have thought that the entire world would have either ended or every country would have nukes. We were able to create a world where nukes only exist in nine countries. We signed nuclear test ban treaties. We didn't deploy nukes to everywhere and just do them above ground all the time. I think of this public deployment of AI as above ground testing of AI. We don't need to do that. We created institutions like the United Nations and Bretton Woods to create a positive sum world so we wouldn't war with each other and try to have security uh, that would hopefully help us avoid nuclear war if we can get through the Ukraine situation. This AI is exponentially harder because it's not countries that can afford uranium to make this specific kind of technology. It's more decentralized. It's like calculus. If calculus is available to everyone. But there are also other moments where humanity faced um, an existential challenge and looked face to face in the mirror. How many people here are aware of the film The Day After? OK, about half of you. It was the largest watched made for TV film in all of human history. Um, it was about um, the prospect of nuclear war which again was a kind of abstract thing that people didn't really want to think about and let's repress it and not talk about it and it's really hard. But they basically said, we need to get the United States and Russia and its citizen populations to see what would happen in that situation. And they aired this, it was the largest made for TV film, 100 million Americans saw it, three or four years later in 1987, they aired it to, um, to all Russians. And it helped lead to a shared understanding of the fate that we move into if we go to full scale nuclear war. And what I wanted to show you was a video that after they aired this to 100 million Americans, they actually followed with an hour and a half Q&A discussion and debate um, between some very special people. So imagine you just saw a film about nuclear war. I think this will feel good to watch this. There is, and you probably need it about now, there is some good news. If you can, take a quick look out the window. It's all still there. Your neighborhood is still there, so is Kansas City and Lawrence and Chicago and Moscow and San Diego and Vladivostok. What we have all just seen, and this was my third viewing of the movie, what we've seen is sort of a nuclear version of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. Remember Scrooge's nightmare journey into the future with the spirit of Christmas yet to come? When they finally return to the relative comfort of Scrooge's bedroom, the old man asks the spirit the very question that many of us may be asking ourselves right now. Whether, in other words, the vision, the vision that we've just seen is the future as it will be, or only as it may be. Is there still time? To discuss, and I do mean discuss, not debate, that and related questions tonight, we are joined here in Washington by a live audience and a distinguished panel of guests. At the time, part of this was, and having this happen, was about not having five people in the Department of Defense and five people in Russia's defense ministry decide whether all of humanity, you know, lives or dies. That was an example of having a democratic debate, a democratic dialogue about what future we want. We don't want a world where five people at five companies onboard humanity onto the AI plane without figuring out what future we actually want. I think it's important to know we're, we're not saying this in an adversarial way. What we're saying is, could you imagine how different we would be walking into this next age? We walked into the nuclear age, but at least we woke up and created the UN Bretton Woods. We're walking to the, the, uh, the AI age, but we're not waking up and creating institutions that span countries. Imagine how different it would be if there was a nationalized, televised, not debate, but discussion from the heads of the major labs and companies and the lead safety experts, like the Iliasers, um, and civic actors. And we really gave this moment in history the weight that it deserves versus another sort of weird article in the New York Times about how the chatbot tried to 
break up the reporter from their way. Part of why we did this is that we noticed that the media has not been covering this in a way that lets you see kind of the picture of the arms race. Um, it's actually been one of our focuses is getting and helping media um, who help the world understand these issues not see them as chatbots or see it as just AI art, but seeing it as there's a systemic challenge where we're um, racing that for, uh, corporations are currently caught, not because they want to be, but because they're caught in this, this arms race to deploy it and to get market dominance as fast as possible. And none of them can stop it on their own. It has to be some kind of negotiated agreement where we all collectively say, what future do we want? Just like nuclear de-escalation. Dozens and dozens and dozens of phone calls. And what we hear from everybody that would help the most is to selectively slow down the public deployment of these large language model AIs. This is not about stopping the research. This is not about not building AI. It's about slowing down the public deployment. And just like we do with drugs or with airplanes, where you do not just build an airplane and then just not test it before you onboard people onto it, or you build drugs that have interaction effects with society that the people who made the drug couldn't have predicted, um, we can presume that systems that have capacities that the engineers don't even know what those capacities will be, we can presume that they're not necessarily safe until proven otherwise. We don't just shove them into products like Snapchat. And we can put the onus on, um, on the makers of, of, of AI rather than on the citizens to prove why they think uh, that it's dangerous. And I know that some people might be saying, but hold on a second. If we slow down public deployment of AIs, aren't we just going to lose to China? And honestly, you know, we want to be very clear. Um, all of our concerns, especially on social media as well, we, we, this is, we want to make sure we don't um, lose to China. We would actually argue that um, the public deployment of AIs, just like social media that were unregulated, that incohered our society, are the things that make us lose to China. Because if you have an incoherent culture, your democracy doesn't work. It's exactly the sort of unregulated or reckless deployment that causes us to lose to China. Um, the Chinese government considers these large language models actually unsafe because they can't control them. They don't shift them uh, publicly to their, to their own population. Yeah. Slowing down the public release of AI capabilities would actually slow down Chinese advances too. So it's actually the open source models that help China advance. Uh, so here's an example. Um, so Facebook released uh, their Gollum uh, pre-trained foundation model. Within days, it was leaked to the internet, um, and in particular to 4chan, which is the very worst part of the internet, the very part of the internet you do not want to have access to creating arbitrary content. Sort of what happens when we start to decentralize, and of course it's the thing then that helps China catch up. And lastly is that the, re the recent US export controls um, have also been really good at slowing down China's progress on advanced AI, and that's a different lever to sort of keep the asymmetry uh, going. You can still do your research as fast as possible. You can just not do as much public deployment and um, still maintain your lead over China. Uh, two solutions that have been like proposed to us are one, like KYC, know your customer. So before you get access to a new model, you have to know, uh, you as a company have to know who you're giving it to. And two, sort of liability or in parental loci. That is to say that if you're gonna release an alien, uh, just like a child, if it goes and breaks something in the supermarket, you have to uh, uh, pay for it. That if you're a Facebook or whoever's making the models, if it gets leaked and it's used, uh, then you should be responsible for it. And this is so important to start thinking about now because even bigger AI developments are coming. They're gonna be coming faster than we think possible. They're gonna be coming faster than even those of us who understand exponentials understand. This is why we've called you here. It's this moment of remember that you were in this room when the next like 10xing happens and then the next 10xing happens after that so that we do not make the same mistake we made with social media. With social media, we had a moment before entanglement. Don't you wish you could go back before it was entangled with society that we did something about it? That is this moment in history right now. We are them then now. It is up to us collectively that when you invent a new technology, it's your responsibility as that technologist to help uncover the new class of responsibilities, create the language, the philosophy, and the laws, because they're not gonna happen automatically. That if that tech confers power, it'll start a race, and if we do not coordinate, that race will end in tragedy. And we know that leaving this presentation, leaving this room, there's gonna be this weird snapback effect, that you are gonna leave here, and you're gonna talk to your friends, and you're gonna read news articles, and it's gonna be more about AI art and ChatGPT bots that said this or that. And you're gonna be like, what the hell, was, was that presentation I went to even real, or is any of this even real? And just want you to notice that effect before it happens. Um, because we notice that even in working on this, it's hard to wrap your head around where this all goes. Just thinking, speaking very personally, um, I, my brain will vacillate. I'll like, see the, everything we're talking about, and then I'll open up Twitter, and I will see um, some cool new set of features. I'm like, where's, where's the harm? Where's the risk? This thing's really cool. Yeah. Um, and then I have to walk myself back into seeing the systemic force. So just be really kind with yourselves that it's going to feel almost like um, the rest of the world is gaslighting you. Uh, and people will say it, you know, cocktail parties, like, you're crazy, like look at all this good stuff it does. And also we are looking at AI safety and bias. Um, so what, 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 show me the harm.
point to me at the harm. It'll be just like social media, where it's very hard to point at the concrete harm at this specific post did this specific bad thing to you. So just take, really take some um, self-compassion. We don't know what the answers are. Um, we just want to gather you here to start a conversation to talk about it and for you all to be able to talk to each other. And we're here to try to help coordinate or facilitate whatever other discussions need to happen that we can help make happen. Um, but what we really wanted to do was just create a shared frame of reference for some of the problems and some of the dark side. Just to repeat what Ava said, AI will continue to also create medical discoveries we wouldn't have had. It's gonna create new things that can eat you know, microplastics and solve problems in our society. It will keep doing those things. And we are not wanting to take away from the fact that those things will happen. The problem is, if as the ladder gets taller, the downsides of, hey, everybody has a bioweapon in their pocket, these are really, really dangerous concerns. And those dangerous concerns undermine all the other benefits. Um, and so we want to find a solution that's you know, negotiated among the players, and uh, we want to get your help to do it.